بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ما يكفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطيع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الحديث حديث محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بلا وكل بلعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار uh, Today إن شاء الله we will begin with the first lesson in Tafsir after a very long break Alhamdulillah, we are back. And uh, based on the advice from Brother Masri, the last month I reward him, and the speaker also, uh, that we should stop uh, studying uh, Surah Yusuf because it's too lengthy. Actually, we are not giving it its right. There is a book written by Abdurrahman al Saadi about the lesson that started from Surah Yusuf. It's very important and interesting. Uh, book, uh, but fortunately it is written in Arabic, so you have to learn Arabic for you to benefit from it. It's a very interesting book, an important book for Muslim to read if you really want to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to send to you by the revelation of Surah Yusuf salam. So we decided to make a stop, because this kind of lessons, when he told me, I, I told him that yes, these kind of uh, classes, we should stick with short surahs because people come and go. Uh, it is the place that we stay here forever. Uh, this is university, no one stays. Even the lecturers also comes and go like this. So uh, normally we will, uh, we, we're supposed to take something that people can benefit before they leave the place. So inshallah, this is what we'll be doing. So today we'll make a new opening with Surah Al-Fatiha. And inshallah, if you were to be patient and to be with us from the beginning till the end, we're going to study the Surah and try to benefit as much as we, we can. Lessons extracted from this Surah. So that in the end, inshallah, you will appreciate what the scholars have mentioned when they say Surah Al-Fatiha is the most important Surah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever did. <coughs> it's taken from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as we're going to see the biggest and the most important surah that Allah SWT ever revealed to humankind is Surah Al-Fatiha. Why did Allah SWT ask you to recite Surah Al-Fatiha at least 17 times in a day? Minimum. If you pray 5 times in a day, when you do the calculation properly, you will find that uh, you are reading and reciting Surah Al-Fatiha at least 17 times. This is for someone who is very stingy for himself, who does not pray the Sunnah prayers. But if you pray the Sunnah prayers, then we don't know how many times we're going to recite the surah in a day. So every day you're repeating the same verses, the same verses, the same verses. Why? So inshallah we will try to learn from those verses why Allah SWT is asking you to repeat the surah every day. Because it is a strong connection between you and Allah SWT, something that will always remind you about your jahal. Something that will always remind you about Allah SWT, something that pu will purify your heart. Yeah. So if you have this view, when you recite Surah Al-Fatiha in a prayer, definitely your righteousness is going to increase. And that's why prayer is a protection and is a deterrence against evils. When you pray, you're more likely I mean, uh, to be someone who is staying away from the sins. You will be greater than someone who is not praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of abstaining from the sins. So Fatiha has a role to play in that. Uh, prayer that you are doing which is taking away from the sins and from the thing that can earn you the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah as I said if you are to be patient with us and try benefit as much as you can and uh, provide any question you want 
whatsoever you decide to ask, please get ready with your questions. We are here in a place of knowledge where we are learning from each other. So ask the speaker. If he knows, he will give you the answer. If not, then he will say to you, Masawa, or guide you to someone who can guide you to the truth, inshallah. So uh, the first thing I would like to talk about Surah Al-Fatiha is the, the place Surah Al-Fatiha was revealed. The place of revelation of the Surah. Uh, this surah, almost by the consensus of the scholars, it is Makkiya. Almost, almost all of the scholars believe that this surah is Makkiya. Uh, when you look at the divine revelation, which is Quran, in terms of revelation, the places it was uh, revealed, you can divide it into two categories based on the best opinion. There are many other opinions which says that uh, Quran can be divided into so many parts in terms of the way it. Uh, I mean, the place it, it was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the best one is the one that says, we divide it into two, Madani and Makki. Madani is someone that, something that is revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and not only in Medina, but after the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whereas the Makki is anything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam receives from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala before he migrated from, from Mecca. That's the best thing you can do to minimize the differences, you understand, and the views. Because if you're going to make it open as what some other scholars uh, do, you're going to have many types of revelation. <coughs> there are some, some of the things that are revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Ta'if, some of them in Arafah, some of them in this and that. So that means you're going to have something, uh, I mean, which is revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the place of Arafah. You have to provide a name for that. And there's something which is revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam inside Mecca but in another place in Mina, for example, you have to provide a name for that. Something which is revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi at the places where he fought the enemies, you have to give that part of the revelation the same name. So in order to minimize the differences, the scholars, they agree that this is the best one, which says that Madani is anything that is revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was in Medina after the migration after the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu which is the Hijrah and Makki is the things that he receives from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala before he left Makkah. Why do we believe that this Surah is Mak Makkiyah? Because scholars by consensus believe that Surah Al-Hijr was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at Makkah. And you know in Surah Al-Hijr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنِ الْمَثَانِ وَالْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ He said, we have already given you سَبْعُ الْمَثَانِ وَالْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ He said, we gave you سَبْعُ الْمَثَانِ This way it was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Makkah and in Makkah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we gave you the سَبْعُ الْمَثَانِ So that's mean, this, these uh, سَبْعُ الْمَثَانِ uh, have to be something that was given to him before he left Mecca. And based on the explanation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith, when he talked about the Sabr al-Mathani, he said this is Surah Al-Fatiha. When he was talking about the names of Surah Al-Fatiha and the nature of the Surah, he said here is Sabr al-Mathani, as we are going to see when we talk about the virtue of the Surah. So the first thing we should, we should know is when this Surah was revealed, it was revealed when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was at Mecca. And also, for your information, some scholars mentioned that this is the only, uh, one of the, or the first surah that was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean in total. The whole thing was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, Quran is given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Munajjama. Munajjama means gradual. So gradually, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to receive the message from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Even the non-Muslim, the non-believers, they question him for that. Why the Torah that was given to him was given to him, I mean the whole thing was given to him entirely. Why Quran is different? Because he receives the Torah, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he received the whole tablets, he came back with them to his people. And this is what we know to be the nature of those books that Allah SWT gave their own people. They came at once. Everything that Allah SWT have to mention in those books, it is mentioned before Allah SWT gave them the book. It wasn't like our own book, which is Quran. But look at the reply Allah SWT gave them. He said, We have given you the Quran so that we will 
make it firmly established in your heart, you will find it very easy to memorize. When you memorize it, you will not forget it. And that's why this is the best way to memorize Quran. There are some, I mean, advertisement from some website that some people they memorize Quran in five days. <laughs> Someone told me in ten days, I said impossible. So then I saw five days, I said, okay, it's better to accept the ten days. Easier. <laughs> All of those memorization, I'm telling you, if it is not something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, put in the mind, someone who is exception, the memorization will never be strong, if that is possible. I mean, a noble human being can memorize Quran in five days. If that is possible, I'm telling you, this is an exception. Out of one million, maybe one person. So Quran is supposed to be memorized gradually. If you really want to keep it with you, Whatsoever you memorize in the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took the Quran, I'm telling you, it is not easy for you to miss it. This is the experience. So for those of you who are memorizing Quran, take this lesson. Take it slowly, slowly. Go gradually. Don't take more than what you can, I mean, memorize in a day. Especially for the people who are new in memorization. Don't go like this. This is what they told us. One of my uh, the teachers, he advised someone to memorize one ayah in a day. He said, no, that's too little for me. He met him after a year. Brother, what happened? How many Jews now you have? He used to say so little. He asked him, he said, no, nothing. Not even one Jesu. He said, had you accepted my advice and you started memorizing ayah in a day, now you have more than a juzu. <coughs> because you're going to have one, uh, 300 and uh, how many in a year? 365 verses in a day, uh, in a year. That's more than a juzu. But unfortunately, he did not make use of the advice, that's why he lost. So I can remember when I was memorizing, the father did not memorize Quran. And I did it based on my own willing. That's why it works, alhamdulillah. I got some sheikh. I never saw someone reading Quran like him. Yeah. He used to be a university student. He doesn't go to his family after the holidays. I used to go see him reading Quran. Leave him reading Quran. Uh, he always stopped to sleep or eat. In the night I would come out. Sometimes I would see him out of, like jinn, out of the house reading, reading. He was the first, the first person to motivate me in memorization of, of the Quran. And I started with him. So I learned these things, how to go with them gradually. So I remember when I was doing, I talked to the father. The father was very strict and he asked me to take only five lines in a day. So I thought, that's too much, uh, too little for me. But I was patient and it really helped me. Because it, tra it trained me, because when I was starting, even to read the Quran was not easy. So that was the only thing that saved. But at that time, I was so eager to finish the Quran, because the Sheikh told me that if you finish it, in the hereafter, your reward will be so great. And actually, we're expecting you to be at the best position that Allah SWT is going to give a human being. After the Prophets, that means for those, your neighbor, it will be Allah SWT. <coughs> So Alhamdulillah, I took it gradually. I reached a moment, this gradual, I mean, experience helped me to reach a position whereby I memorized a surah in a day, which has more than five pages. And the Sheikh was, he did not want to believe. He said, it doesn't work, cannot. So I read it to him, he kept on telling others. So the reason why I'm bringing this, so that you will know that this is what other people experience. So start gradually, if you really want to keep what you have memorized. So since I have talked about this, and I believe, inshallah, there are some people who are memorizing, so I will give you these tips before I move. When you memorize, don't you ever memorize Quran in a day. Don't memorize Quran in a day. Memorize it in the morning, before Fajr, I mean after Fajr. After you pray, the first thing you should do is the recitation of what you have memorized yesterday. 
These are the tips to help you to keep it. I'm telling you, if you're patient, I gave some students some of this. They said it's too difficult, but they couldn't forget what they memorized in that way. They stick with them. At the time, one of the students was reading to me Surah Al Isra. I asked him, How come it is like this? He said, No, your advice is working. He was punished in the way he was memorizing and revising, so it worked. He couldn't forget it. And I believe if I'm to see him now, I ask him to read Surah Al Isra, he will read it. Yeah. That's a benefit. So memorize it in the morning after Fajr. And the first thing you should do is to revise what you have memorized yesterday. Then, before you move, Take the new pages you want to memorize, memorize them, and then go. Then try as much as, I can, uh, much as you can the whole day, spend it in those pages, new pages you memorize. The last thing you should do before you sleep, don't go to sleep without reading what you have memorized in that day. Read it without looking at the Quran first, and then go <coughs> sleep. Bi'idhnillah, if you make it in this way, it is not easy for you to miss it. My sheikh told me there is someone who read one juzo completely, he was sleeping, and there was no mistake, someone was watching him, was following. A juzo, imagine 20 pages this, this sheikh was reading, no mistake whatsoever. Imam al-Amash, one of the greatest muhaddithin, and also one of the great people in terms of Quran, he led them in Taraweeh for 40 years. They said he never made a mistake, even one haraka. Nowadays, come and see the Imam in the Taraweeh. Allah must that. May Allah reward them, but <laughs> come and see the way they read. They didn't know this in the, in the past. There is someone who was righteous and then he became corrupt. After five years, he came back again. Remember this, after five years he has been absent from recitation of the Quran. After five years someone advised him to come back to Allah, he came. At that moment, they were fasting Ramadan, so they begged him to be the Imam. Imagine, no revision, no anything, went, he led them in Taraweeh prayer till then. So how did he memorize the Quran? It was really memorization, not the way we are doing nowadays. I'm telling you the reason why we cannot memorize Quran properly nowadays is because we are not memorizing it. Many people claim to be memorizing Quran, but in reality, I'm telling you the truth, they don't memorize Quran. They just go through it. Because memorization, you have to really memorize it when you are memorizing it the first time. So that means you should read it till you are satisfied that this one will never go. Sometimes you have to make it like Fatiha. Who knows when he memorized Fatiha? Who can imagine that he will forget Fatiha one day? <laughs> there are some people who are like this in the Quran. So my advice to you, join the community of Quran, the people of Quran, because it's so great. There are a lot to be said here, but <coughs> to save time, this is my uh, simple advice to you. Memorize the Quran, but memorize it properly when you memorize it. Read it a lot, read it a lot. Read more than 100 times when you're memorizing before, before you leave. So the surah, according to some scholars, is the only surah, I mean the first surah that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ completely. Why? Because people need it in their own prayer. So it has to be revealed completely because it is one of the pillars of the prayer. That's the first thing. The second thing is... <coughs> about the virtue of the surah. Is there anything said by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the importance of Surah Al-Fatiha? Yes, there are many. The first one is the hadith of Abi Sa'id ibn Mu'alla radiallahu anhu, one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met him praying. Uh, he called him Ya Aba Sa'id. So he did not go to the Prophet because he was praying. After he finished, he went to the Prophet and apologized. The Prophet talked to him first. He said, why didn't you come to me when I first asked you to come? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I was praying. 
He said, no, didn't you hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying in the Quran, Istajibu lillahi wa lil rasuli idha da'akum lima yuhiyyukum. Answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet whenever he invites you to something that will make you alive. So some scholars is structured from this that if the Prophet invites you, even if you're praying, you have to cut it off and go. Some of them, they said, replying to the Prophet is not notifying your prayer. You can come back and continue. But most of them, they said, no, you have to stop it because accepting the invitation of the Prophet is wajib. And you have to listen. And he is your instructor, the one who is guiding you to the right way, how to pray. Maybe the Prophet ﷺ receives from Allah SWT that that prayer you are doing is wrong, you have to stop. You don't know, so that's why at any moment this is specifically given to the Prophet ﷺ alone. So when the Prophet ﷺ talked to him in this way, why did you accept my invitation when I first invited you? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I thought if I'm praying I should continue, but I apologize, Ya Rasulullah, I will never do it again. This is what is mentioned in some narration, he said, I will never do it again, Ya Rasulullah. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him, "Ya Abu Sa'id, before you leave the masjid, I'm going to teach you a surah. There is no surah like it in the Quran. The best surah in the Quran. You will learn it from me." So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam kept on receiving people in the masjid. He kept on receiving people in the masjid. He kept on receiving people in the masjid. So. After the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam finished, he decided to leave. So what happened? Abu Ya'la, Abu Sa'id ibn Mu'alla, he, re he realized that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi is going to go, and if he go out of the masjid, most likely he will not tell him. And he said, I will tell you this surah before I leave the masjid. So he said, I was walking behind the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam next to him, and I was talking to him. He was talking to me. I was. I started walking slowly, 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 so that he would not reach the end of the masjid. Because had he reached the end of the masjid, that means I will lose. So at the last part of the masjid, when he reached the door, I said, Ya Rasulullah, you promised me to teach me a surah which is the best surah that Allah SWT ever revealed. Which surah is that? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it is Surah Al-Fatiha, wa hiya sab'ul mathani wa quran al-azim al-ladhi utitu. He said, this is Surah Al-Fatiha. And this is the greatest surah that Allah SWT ever revealed. And it is the Quran al azim that Allah SWT gave me. When he says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِي وَالْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ The same even took place also with Ubay ibn Ka'ab. He also, the Prophet also met him praying, and he asked him different stories. Some people, they get confused. They said, no, this is the same thing, but some narrators, they are confused. No, this is different even took place, but in the same nature. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam called him. He also refused to reply to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he was praying. After he finished, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him the same thing. And he apologized. He said, "I will not do it again, Ya Rasulullah." And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "I am going to teach you a surah that Allah SWT never revealed anything from the Torah or any book that ever exists, which is better than it. I will do that before I go out of the masjid." So he also, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, told him that this is Surah Al-Fatiha and it is the Sabr al-Mathani wal Quran al-Azim al-Ladi utitu. So these are some of the some of the virtues of this surah. It is enough for you to know that this is the greatest thing that Allah subhanahu wa taala ever existed. Some scholars they rejected this uh, this explanation to say that this. Uh, this is the best thing found in the Quran because if you say this, that means there is something which is less important than Surah Al-Fatiha in the Quran. And according to this uh, scholar, everything in the Quran is equal in terms of important, importance. And this is wrong because since the Prophet Sallallahu said the greatest Surah that Allah SWT ever revealed, that means Quran is not equal. Some part of this is better than the other part. Allah SWT in the Quran says, We will never abrogate a verse from the Quran except we will bring something similar to it or better than it. That means there is something better than what is abrogated by Allah SWT. So the verses of the Quran are not equal. 
The Prophet sallallahu mentioned that Ayatul Kursi is the greatest ayah that Allah subhanahu ever revealed. So that means some part of it is bigger than the other part. So the statement mentioned by the majority based on this hadith that Quran is not equal in terms of importance, some of it is more important than the other one. It is the only truth that we have. So as I said, there are many, many, many other hadiths mentioned by the scholars. If you want more detail, read the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. Not the summarized one, the complete version. You will see a lot of narration mentioned by this man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Ummah with, Imam Ibn Kathir, one of the students of Shaykh al-Islam in Taymiyyah. The next thing is about the verses of Surah Al-Fatiha. How many verses <coughs> the Surah has? Seven. seven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ati anaka sab'a uh, sa, sa, sab minal mathani wal Qur'an al So it is almost a consensus of all of the scholars that Surah Al-Fatiha has seven verses. Except one controversy that is not counted. Because the scholars have mentioned the following. ليس كل خلاف جاء معتبرا إلا خلاف له حظ من النظر. Not every controversy that comes from the scholars you recognize it as something which is appreciated. Some controversy you don't look at them at all. For example, someone says, if a pro this is just uh, example, someone says, if a sister lost her husband, for example, at the age of eighteen. So she already reached the age of maturity. And then the, the period, the man says cut off. She couldn't see it at all. So he said, this woman is not a young woman who did not see it before. So we cannot give her the same ruling. And she is not an old woman also that we can give the ruling of someone who lost hope in these type of issues. So that means we have to wait for something else. So he said, according to him, since we have nothing from the Prophet وسلم, nothing from uh, Quran to talk about this issue because we don't know the reason why these things stopped. And it, things has to be based on it. So according to him, she has to stay for 60 years without marriage. Then after 60 years, she has to take the ruin of an old woman who is not seeing the period. That's been th three more months. And then afterward, if she wish, she can marry. So when you talk about this issue, you say, free khilaf. There is controversy. Which controversy? Anything. Ibn Taymiyyah, when he talked about this, he saw by Allah, he said the religion of Allah SWT did not come except to erase this type of difficulties. It doesn't exist. Someone says, if someone pee in a bucket or a cup of water and put it in the water he's making wudu, he can make wudu with it, no problem. Because the Prophet wasalam, said, don't pee directly inside. And then when you talk about this issue, he said there is khilaf. Which khilaf? No khilaf, it is only one opinion. So that's why it is a very important I mean, uh, uh, principle in Islam that not every controversy comes <coughs> among the scholars. You should recognize this as something which is appreciated. No, it has to be based on a strong delete. Then we can understand the other side and we can recognize it and we can say, yes, <coughs> we are not supposed to blame you for anything. Because if a khilaf is recognized by Sharia, then Islamically, when someone is doing what is against what you're doing, you cannot say to him, no. You get it? This is also the principle in da'wah the scholars have given. Before you ask someone to stop doing something which is wrong, you have to make sure that what he's doing is wrong. So that means, if the issue is controversial, you cannot ask him to stop it. But the controversy has to be something which is recognized and appreciated by Sharia. Not everything that the scholars disagree, anyone, whether it has proof, there is evidence to support it, or there is nothing, and then you just say, no, there is khilaf, no, it doesn't work like this. Yeah. I'm saying this because nowadays most of the people, whenever you talk about some issues, the first thing that will come in their mind is, no, this, uh, some scholars said some, something else, fi khilaf, which khilaf? There is only one hadith, unfortunately. Wallahi, in most of the cases, what 
will make you sad is when you ask him what is the evidence of what you are saying, he has nothing except someone told him fi khilaf, there is khilaf in the issue. So I don't know whether if these people go back to Allah SWT, they are going to tell him Allah, this issue fi khilaf, that's why we... <laughs> Oh. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I really appreciate there was a debate took place in the Masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I was sitting down on the place. Then uh, someone came to the Masjid. He sat down after Asr. A brother from Algeria. He was sitting down next to him. He looked at him. He said, "Brother, stand up and pray." I was looking at him like boss commanding someone to do something. He never knew him, but just he came, he stood, uh, 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 sat down, and he told him, stand up and pray. And the guy looked at him and said, why? He said, stand up and pray. He said, why? He said, stand up and pray. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very interesting debate. So I, I look at him as a brother, he is asking you for the proof. Unfortunately, he did not know why is he asking him to pray. His sheikh told him that he should pray whenever you come to the masjid. That's true. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi have mentioned it. But the majority of the scholars mentioned that when you come to the masjid after Asr, they said you should sit down. Although this controversy issue also is recognized, the controversy is recognized. But you have to make sure that you have something to support you, your side. He did not know. So he kept on talking, 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 talking. Then I stepped in. So he came back to me. I, I, I kept on going with him. So I told him that, yes, Sheikh Mukhtar, Sheikh so and so and so, they said this and that. Uh, his, his, his own uh, Sheikh that he only believes in is Sheikh Nasir Din Alban. If Sheikh Nasir Din Alban did not say this, he will never accept. He said, brother, is, is he or Allah or what? So he said, no, no, he's the only one who talk about this issue. Others, I said, all of them, Ibn Taymiyyah and all of those people, they never talk about this issue. He said, no, he talk about it in detail. So one of the points I mentioned, I said the Prophet wasallam said, if you come to the masjid, you shouldn't pray after Asr. And that's a very authentic hadith. <coughs> Ibn Abbas mentioned this hadith. He said, Hadara in indi rijalun mardiyun, wa ardahun indi umar. He said, the group of people came to me, and the best one amongst them, I am very pleased with them. The best amongst them is Umar radiallahu anhu. And they told me that the Prophet wasallam said, you should not pray after Asr till sunset. And this hadith is authentic found in Sayyid Bukhari. Get it in the al Sayyid Bukhari is Muslim actually. So I told him this. He did not know that. So he told me, Fee khilaf. <laughs> Next to him, there is one, uh, someone from Pakistan. I really uh, enjoyed the way he was. He said, Brother, he's telling you that the Prophet says something, you are telling him, Fee khilaf? <laughs> So this is the nature of the people of today. Whenever someone talks about something, they will say fi khilaf. Oh, brothers and sisters, a deen is the most sensitive things that you have to think of first. Wallahi. Protect your deen. Don't you ever play with it. And therefore, it is my personal advice to you that you should make sure that the one that you take deen from him is someone who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi. If you don't do this, you will be in trouble one day and no one will be there to save you. Remember this. The scholars have mentioned that Muqallid, you know who is Muqallid, right? Someone who follows. Muqallid also must do ijtihad because they categorize people around three categories. The scholars, these ones, if they have the qualities of making ijtihad, they are not allowed to follow another ijtihad. They have to make the ijtihad and find the truth. Whenever ishtihad is needed, a scholar must make ishtihad and find the truth. Because it is not necessary that the other part who is making the ishtihad is right. Maybe when you look at the Nusus, you will find something else different from what he is instructed. So this, this said, you must make ishtihad if you are qualified to make ishtihad. And there is another category, the student of knowledge. They can look at the Nusus of Sharia and extract from them lessons. And these people, this is their job. It is haram for them to follow a scholar without knowing the delay. They can't. This is what is called taqlid. Taqlid is wrong Islamically. This type of, this type of taqlid is wrong. There is the other category, which is the masses of the people of today. The muqallidun, the common people of the street. 
They also has to do, have to do ijtihad. What type of ijtihad? When you show him ayah from the Quran, he will never know what Allah subhanahu is talking about. Give him the zubda. Give him the, 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 the lesson, the result, the conclusion. This is what they need. But the scholars have mentioned that these people also must do ijtihad. In what sense? You have many scholars in the city. You have sheikh this and this, sheikh so and so, sheikh so and so, sheikh so and so. This one is saying something different from the other one. So my job as a muqallid, I have to look at each and every one of them to find out which one fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more according to my own understanding. There must be someone that you, you, you are satisfied with. You cannot just say, no, let me take from everyone in the way we are doing. And that's why the scholars mentioned that it is wrong. One of them even said it is prohibited for you when you ask a sheikh to ask another one. You can't do this because you are making yourself confused. I need something. I trusted Sheikh Masri. Then I went to him. Sheikh, what is the hukum? And then he told me. The next day I went to uh, Sheikh yes, Yasser. Yes, Sheikh Yasser. Sheikh Masri last time told me that this, this is how it should be. Sheikh Yasser is going to say, no, 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 he does not understand the thing properly. And then he gave me a new explanation. What am I going to do? The next day, whatever Masri told me, I'm going to say, Sheikh, are you sure? <laughs> if I cannot ask him when I go back, I will be in a state of doubt. Maybe it is incorrect. So to close this, the scholars, they said, as long as you choose one of them who fears Allah SWT the most, you have done your job. Allah SWT will never question you. So you don't need to put yourself into a state of confusion. So when you take what Sheikh Masri told you and you worship Allah SWT with it, who will be responsible? <laughs> but when you didn't take what Sheikh Masri told you and you went looking for your own and shopping the, the fatwas, this is what we do. Trying to take as much as we can and then in the end we compare between them which one is the easier we will take. Alhamdulillah. Abu Hanifa, as if he knows people that are going to be like this, he said, man, if you keep on following the ruchas, the easy things according to you, you will end up by being zindik. Zindik is the, the other name for hypo, hypocrite. Munafik. I mean, you're going to lose your deen one day. So you get it? So it is very important for people who are living in these days to know whom to take knowledge from. Especially when you know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said before the Day of Judgment, people, they will take, actually the hadith is as follow. He said, Allah SWT will never take the knowledge from the heart of the people. It means you just leap and then you wake up without knowledge. This one will happen before the Day of Judgment. Quran will be taken from the heart and also from the papers also. Allahumma star. There will be a time, what you have in your heart, you will lose it. You will quickly go back to check your Quran. You will see blank pages. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, I heard this from your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That's fact. It will happen, but this is one of the last things that will happen before the Day of Judgment. After then, hope will be taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows the level of evil that exists at that moment. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never take knowledge by taking it from the heart of the people, but he will take it by taking the scholars one after another. And my brothers and sisters, this is one of the things also that you have to pay attention now. <coughs> now who is that big, big, big scholar that we will point and we say, yes, we have this one. In a year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took Ten years ago, Allah SWT took the greatest scholars that we have. To our knowledge, Sheikh Ibn Uthameen died, Sheikh Nasir died, Sheikh Ibn Baz died, Sheikh Ali Hassan al Nadawi in India died, Sheikh Umar Fulata died, Sheikh Atiyah Mahmoud Salim died. I was counting them. And no one is talking about this issue. I just look at them based on this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing, taking them one after another. And he said, Hatta idha lam yubqi aliman, or lam yubqa alimun, ittaqad al-nasu ru'usan juhalan. Till the time 
that there will be no sheikh left. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took all of them. And then people, they are going to take leaders. Leaders here means scholars. Who are supposed to be scholars, but in reality, they are ignorant people. And these people, they don't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَسُئِلُوا فَأَفْتَوْ فَضَلُّوا وَأَضَلُّوا They will be asked by people, and they will not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will give fatwa, they will be misguided, and they will misguide others. Before, fatwa is not easy. Yeah. Someone said, a person went to the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he met a group of companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He asked a question. The first one, he asked him. He said, go to the, that one. He knows the answer, but he said, go to the other one. He went to the other person. The other person also said, Go to the other one. They kept on sending him to, I mean, many companions, till the time he came back to the first one. They said he cried first and then he gave him the fatwa. Brothers, why did he do that? Because I'm telling you, wallahi, if you know how much trouble you put in yourself if you give fatwa which is wrong in the eyes of Allah, wallahi, you would never open your mouth and talk. It's too dangerous. One of the scholars was describing the scenario. He said, just put it like this. You will come in the day of judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he will ask you, how did you get this knowledge that you are worshipping me upon it? You will say, Sheikh Masri told me. And then they will bring Sheikh Masri. They will release all of the chain they put on that person, put them on Masri. How did you get them? He will say, Sheikh Yasir told me. Okay, Masri, you are saying, go. How did you get them, Sheikh Yasir? Were you the one who told him? Yes, I told him. Okay, how did you get them? Sheikh Muhammad told me, not Ibrahim. So they will keep on going, going, going all the way till you go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is how it will end. But imagine if at the first time Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala asked you, how did you get this information that you gave someone? You told him that this is what I want, and then you have no answer. What do you think it will be? Wallahi, it is tragedy. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقُفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُعَادَ كُلُّ أُولَئِكَ كَانَ عَلَيْهِ Don't you ever follow something that you have no knowledge of. Don't you ever say something without knowledge because the hearing and the heart and your seeing, all of these, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question you about them in the hereafter. That's why Ibn al-Qayyim in his book, Ilam al waqain and by the way, the scholars have mentioned that if you're really a student of knowledge, you must read one of the two books. Jamil al-Ulum al-Hikam, this is written by Ibn Rajab, the commentary, the best commentary on Arba'un Nawiyah, Jamil al-Ulum al-Hikam. It's one volume, very interesting book. I never saw a commentary like that. Maybe that of Ibn Uthameen, the recent one. But if you're looking for the early commentary on those uh, 40 hadith, is that which is uh, uh, written by Ibn Rajab. It will really prepare you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the knowledge as well. The second book is the book written by Ibn Qayyim, Ilam al Muqayyim, and Rabbil Alim. The title of this book is so interesting because you can, you can translate it in two ways. Either Ilam al Muqayyim informing you about the great people who sign a contract with Allah SWT, that they are going to convey the message to others in the way it should be. So that's scary. The second one is more scary. Ilam al muqayyim is a great reminder from Sheikh Ibn al-Qayyim to all of those people who signed a contract with Allah SWT, that they will convey the message in the way Allah SWT wants it. So your nature as a scholar is what he has mentioned. That Allah SWT is the one who is supposed to convey the message by himself. You said to Allah SWT, I will do it on your behalf. And I will never cheat. And I will never say something that I don't know. I will do it in the way you want. Brothers and sisters, what do you think if you're going to be taken back to Allah SWT, having signed this contract between you and him, and yet 
you do not give it its right. There are many places where you give fatwa and you don't know what you are saying. Nowadays it's very difficult for me to say I don't know. And still I don't know. No, I have to make my own mind. Thanks to one of our scholars, Dr. Ibrahim Sandukuji, he said at the last time we met him, he said, brothers, I wasn't sisters in Islamic University, but he said, brothers, what I can advise you is one thing. Whenever you give fatwa, you're going to graduate from Islamic University, be careful. Whenever you give fatwa, don't attribute the fatwa to yourself. Because by, be, by doing that, you will be responsible. Take it back to the scholars. Let them be responsible. <laughs> and I found it very interesting. Take it back to the scholars. The scholars said, scholars said, scholars said, scholars said. Don't say Shamsuddin said. No, you will be in trouble in the hereafter. Look at Imam Malik. They came to him with around 40 questions or even more. And he answered around six of them. The rest, he told them, I don't know. The guy told him, Chef, I'm coming all the way from Morocco, from Maghrib. And people, they have been compiling these questions, waiting for the moment they can see you. And then you are telling me you don't know? What do you want me to explain to them? He said, go to them and tell them you ask Imam Malik. And he said, I don't know. That's very simple. That's why someone said, one of the scholars mentioned that, Man qala la adri, faqad after. If you say, I don't know, it's part of fatwa also. Because someone is going to narrate this from you. Sheikh so and so and so was asked, and he said, I don't know. So, to summarize what I have said, be careful. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will meet you one day. Whenever hadith is explained to you, and it's clear before you. Wallahi, you have no right to leave it. That's what Imam Shafi'i said. Ajmal Muslimuna. Ala anna man istabanat lahu sunnatu rasul rasulullah. Lam yakun lahu an yada'aha li qawli ahadin ka'ilam mankan. He said, it is the consensus of all of the Muslimin. Not even the scholars. No, all of the Muslimin. It is the consensus of all of the Muslimin that whoever receives the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and it is clear to him, he understands it, he has no right to leave it because of the statement of someone. Imam Abu Hanifa said, if you believe in Allah and you really fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will never take my word without weighing it with the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa first. Imam Malik took his students, all of them, and he went to them to the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He asked them, "Who is in this grave?" They said, "This is the Rasulullah." He said, "You have to know that no one among us, except you, can take from what he said, and you can reject whatsoever you want, except this one. You have no right to say to him no or to give your own analysis. You have to blindly take from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam." Imam Ahmad used to stop his students from writing whatsoever he said. Why? He said, take it from where I took. Take it from the original source. The sunnah of the Prophet <coughs> is compiled for you. Just go and take it from there. So I'm bringing this from you because nowadays whenever you talk, someone will ask you, which Imam says this? Which Imam says this? Which mother have you followed? Which mother have you not followed? So say to them what Ibn Taymiyyah said in his book. <coughs> about, uh, the book of Ibudi or Ibadat. Fikul Ibadat. He sometimes he will mention controversy among the scholars. Very interesting. He will say, this is the opinion of Imam Malik, supported by Imam Shafi. And that is the opinion of Imam Ahmad. And that is the opinion of Imam Malik. But the madhab of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi, he will use madhab also. <laughs> the madhab of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said something different. So it is very simple. And this is the reason why I found it very difficult to understand why people I mean, don't like to accept this concept, which is very easy. When Allah SWT sent this deen, He knows that Ibrahim exists, Masri exists, Karima exists, Bashira exists, Fatima exists, many people exist. But Allah SWT did not choose any of those people to bring the message to humanity. 
But he chose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to show to the people that there is only one source you can learn the deen. To avoid having differences. Because if Allah SWT is going to send to Masri, send to Yasir, send to Kareem, we are going to, to have different versions of religion. Get the idea? So to unite Muslim upon one opinion which is the truth, Allah SWT has sent one person. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he told you that in the grave, Allah SWT will only ask you about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Your shaykh will never be there. And in fact, you will never see them actually. And in fact, even if they're next to you, they will never support. They will just keep quiet. And not only this, wallahi, if you see your shaykh, the one that you used to praise, make him like the Prophet Wasallam. in some cases like Allah SWT, wallahi, if he sees you in the hereafter, he will run away from you. He will never let himself to, to stay with you because he will be afraid of you questioning him if Allah SWT. Allah, this is the one that misguided me. Get him. He will run away. So that means the best thing you should do, take Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be the best friend of yours because you will be questioned about him in the grave. And in the hereafter, <coughs> Allah SWT will ask you also about the way you reply him when you are living in this life. So it's very simple. Make sure that whatsoever you are doing has a root from the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and relax. But if you take it from others, and you close your eyes and the truth comes to you. You do not take it from the people who are reminded of the truth just because someone said it. Wallahi, be very careful. A day will come, this person that you are imitating will never support or help you at all. So that's it. So nothing exi exists except one truth taken from the Prophet Sallallahu So remember this formula given by the scholars. Not every controversy that came from the scholars is recognized to be something which is supposed to be appreciated by you or others. You know, some controversy is so bad based on desire. When you read them, you know that someone does not fear Allah SWT when he said them. Wallahi, especially today, there are some, some opinions when you read them, you know that this person is not speaking the truth. He knows what is the truth, but he is just looking for something else. So you will be the victim if you don't choose the best in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to give you what you should do in terms of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as I said, the consensus of the scholars is, uh, established, is established upon uh, the statement that says the verses of Surah Al-Fatiha are seven. So now, the last thing that I will talk about and then we will close the topic, inshallah, for today. Which one is counted and which one is not counted? So the, the greatest controversy is with the Bismillah rahman rahim Is it part of Surah Al-Fatiha or is it not part of Surah Al-Fatiha? Most of the scholars believe that Surah Al-Fatiha, uh, Bismillah rahman rahim is not included in Surah Al-Fatiha. Imam Ibn Kathir, when he talks about this issue, he bases it on another issue. So, which is, when you read Surah Al-Fatiha, are you supposed to read the Bismillah rahman rahim louder when you're reciting Surah Al-Fatiha louder? For example, you're praying Maghrib, go to the Masajid, Bismillah rahman rahim and then Surah Al-Fatiha. The same way you read Surah Al-Fatiha louder, Bismillah rahman rahim are you supposed to read it louder or are you supposed to read it silently? Although you're reading the, sur the Surah louder. This is another also issue that the controversy of the scholars exist. Some companions of the uh, uh, companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam believe that Bismillah rahman rahim should be recited the same recitation as the Fatiha itself. <coughs> so, so that means if you're praying Zuhr, you shouldn't say Bismillah rahman rahim louder and then Alhamdulillah. <laughs> it doesn't work. You're reciting Surah Al-Fatiha silently. That means Bismillah rahman rahim should follow. But when you pray in Maghrib, you should make it louder in the way you're going to recite the surah. But the Khulafa al-Rashidun, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and many, many other companions believe that Bismillah rahman rahim is not supposed to be recited louder in any prayer. Why? Because Aisha said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam normally start the recitation of the Quran with the word Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. 
Another companion said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always start his recitation with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Abu Hurairah came one day. He recited Quran and started with Surah uh, with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. He recited it louder, and he told the companions, the rest of the people who were praying behind him, the reason why I'm raising up my voice so that you will know that you should you're supposed to read it in the the recitation. So, if the recitation of the uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim was I mean, uh, given by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he used to recite it louder so that everyone can hear. Abu Hurairah would never need to explain it to the people because they already know, and they will never find it strange. But they found it strange because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not doing it. He was the only one to them did it, and he told them that the reason why I raise my voice so that you will know that you are supposed to read Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, just like the way when Abdullah ibn Abbas was praying the Janaza prayer. He recited Surah Al-Fatiha louder, so people they were surprised. He said, no, I recited it louder so that people would know that Fatiha should be recited at the first rakah. He was doing it to teach people, and this method was taken from the Prophet Sallallahu He used to pray on top of the mimbar, and then after he finished, he would tell them, I did that so that you would know how to pray from, from me. He would go on top of the mimbar so that everyone can see him there. No one is praying on the member. And he never did that. But one day came the Prophet also praying on the member. When he decided to make ruku and sujood, he came down a little bit so that he can have space to bow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he told them at the end, the reason why I make it like this so that you people will know how you should pray. And the scholars mentioned that whenever you decide to teach people, you can raise a voice so that they will know. Even you as a imam, if you're praying in front of people who I mean, don't know that Fatiha should be recited, and you pray in Zuhur with them. Make it louder so that they can hear. After you finish, at least some part of Fatiha, the places that are known. And then after you finish, explain to them the reason why I raise my voice, so that people will know that Fatiha should be recited in this, in this place. For the purpose of teaching and training, there is no problem with that. With that. So Imam uh, Ibn Kathir say, say, said, the, 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 the other opinion is based, uh, the other issue is based on this issue. The one who says you should recite it louder, you understand, believes that fa uh, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim is part of Surah Al Fatiha. The one who says you must recite it silently, they said, no, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim is not part of Surah Al Fatiha. But let's see which one is the correct opinion. The other one, the one that says it's part of Surah Al-Fatiha. They said because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِ وَالْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ We gave you several mathani, that's been ten verses. Mathani means what? Something that is repeated. It has many, many definitions. One of them is something that is repeated because he repeats Surah Al-Fatiha in every rakah. Some scholars say no, Mathani means something that has opposite. <coughs> Allah Smarta talks about Jannah and talks about hell. Like this, talk about righteous people and evil ones. This is Mathani. So, whatever definition you're going to give, this is not <coughs> it's our concern, is Allah Smarta mentioned the word seven, which shows that Fatiha is seven. So, they said Fatiha is seven. If you don't count Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, it will be six. And there is opinion also which says six verses. So they said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Malik Yawm Al-Din. Iyak Na'abud wa Iyak Na'sta'in. Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim. Sirat Al-Ladhin An'amta Alayhim. Ghayri Al-Magdubi Alayhim. Walad-Dallin. They said, this is our evidence. You can see, when you go to the other opinion, they will tell you also, this is our own opinion. This is our own evidence. Because Allah SWT says, Sab'am Min Al-Mathani Wal-Quran Al-Azim. We give you seven verses. So all of them are using one information, one evidence. That's callous. And that's why you must give them excuses. Ibn Taymiyyah said, there is no one among the recognized scholars who ever, who ever intentionally disobeyed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. None of them. Abu Hanifa never disobeyed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa intentionally. Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad, all of them, they respect the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa better than the way you can imagine. 
someone asked Imam Malik to give him one hadith on the way. And Imam Malik was very mad at that person. When he went back, he found his student waiting for him at the house. He said, please go and find someone on the way, the one who asked me to recite hadith on the way. Go look for him and find him and beat him 12 times. They went. They found that he is the chief justice of the city. The second person in Medina. After the governor, he is the second man. They came back to Imam Malik. They said, Imam, cannot. Cannot. He said, why? They said, no, this is the most important person in this place. We cannot beat him. He said, who is that? They said, this is the, uh, the judge. He said, no, go beat him 12 times, uh, 12 times because he's the best person to be educated. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> so he said, now they said, go to jail for how many? <laughs> so they went, and the guy was so humble. They told him, your mom says, you disrespect the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, therefore you should be beaten 12 times. He said, no problem, get me. They beat him 12 times. In the night, Imam Malik called him to his house. And he said, the reason why I asked them to do so, because you shouldn't ask me to read the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the way. This is Muhammad. You should respect him. He said, so since you accepted the beating, I'm going to give you 12 hadith. Each one is, <coughs> each, I mean, the large is equivalent to one hadith. So he got 12 hadiths and he used to say, I wish, wallahi, they beat me 100 times and I got 100 hadiths from him. <laughs> he was beaten, Imam Malik, by a scorpion. 13 times, he did not move from his position. Allah, what kind of respect is this? Yeah. Now there's no respect at all. Allah, they ask him, the students saw his face changing after they, after they finished the class, the hadith class it was. They finished the hadith, they asked him, Shaykh, what happened? He told them, this is what happened. They said, why didn't you move? He said, no, I'm reading the hadith of the Prophet. I moved because of scorpion. Now it is, and comes the room, half of this room left. <laughs> so they respected the Prophet وسلم, more than us. They respected the Prophet وسلم, more than the way we respect him. So Imam Ibn Taymiyyah said, there is no one among them who ever intentionally disobey Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa If you see any disobedience to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what I mean by disobedient is, uh, disobedience is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying something and Imam Malik is saying something else. Yeah. So he said it is based on three things. Either they don't get the sunnah from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which is possible, which the people of today don't want to accept. When you tell them, no, this is against the sunnah. They will say, no, my imam knows all of the sunnah, and he, he did not say this. And Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, either those big imams, they don't get the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or he got the sunnah, but it's not authentic to him. Or it is authentic, but he misunderstood. Imam Shafi'i said, if you give someone something, you can take it back. They ask him, why? He said, because the Prophet said, said, the one who is given a gift and take it back, it's just like a dog that vomited and he took back his vomit. And it is not haram for a dog to take back his vomit. <laughs> and the Prophet is making an analogy. It's not haram for, for the dog to take back. So you are just like the dog. <laughs> Imam Ahmad was there. He said, Imam, Sheikh, he was the student of Imam Ahmad. Shafi. He said, Sheikh, but this is against the Sunnah of the Prophet. So the Prophet said, and you are expecting Imam Ahmad to give another proof. He used the same hadith. This is show different levels of understanding. He said, because Imam, uh, because the Prophet at the beginning of that hadith, he said, We don't have evil and bad example in Islam. Imam Shafi did not know this part. So he asked him about the authenticity and then he changed his opinion. So sometimes you can see a scholar saying something based on a hadith and another scholar is saying something based on uh, the same hadith but the different views. So where is, where, what is the measurement? How do I know which one is right, which one is wrong? I have to go back to the sunnah of the Prophet 
It's a very long issue. You have to go back to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to know which one is right, which one is supported by the Sunnah. So when we go back to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or we go back to the Quran itself, we found that, yes, the one that says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is not part of Surah Al-Fatiha, is the closest one to be the truth. Why? First of all, all of the scholars agree, to my knowledge, that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is not part of any surah except Surah al Naml. Innahu min Sulaymana wa innahu Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Everyone agrees that this is part of this surah. So they believe that the norm of the Quran with regard to Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is to make Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim as a verse that is standing by itself to show to the reader that the surah ends and the new surah is going to begin. That's the culture, that's the norm of the Quran. So this is what we should accept and this is what we should take. For you to change this norm, you have to bring evidence from the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is no such evidence. Why do we stick with this opinion? Because the people, the reciters of Medina, such as Nafir and others who are in Medina, understand? They believe that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is not part of Surah Al Fatiha. So when they recite Surah Al Fatiha, when they tell you, these are the reciters, I'm not talking about the Fuqaha, the reciters, when they recite Surah Al Fatiha, they will never include Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. According to them, they believe that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is just like any other Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim found in, surah, uh, in, the, in the Quran, except in Surah Al Naml. So which one is the verse number seven to them? They cut the last one. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim, sirat al ladina an amta alayhim, they stop. This is verse by itself. Ghayr al magdubi alayhim wala dalin. This is verse. And this recitation is taken from the Prophet, and this is what some countries read in their own prayer. It is one of the ruayat al mutawatira to the Prophet. So scholars mention that if you say that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is part of Surah Al-Fatiha, according to that reciter, Surah Al-Fatiha has so, uh, how many verses? Eight. And that's contradiction. Quran is saying seven, and you are saying eight. So that's why they said they said we have to go back to the norm. The norm is the one that says Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is not part of Surah Al-Fatiha, but it is it is just a verse that is standing by itself to show to the reader that the surah ends and the new one is going to begin. So in conclusion, what is the benefit of knowing this? That Bismillahir Rahman Rahim is included or is not included? It is not a waste of time. No, there is a great benefit in that. Which is, if you know the pillars of the prayer, you definitely know that Fatiha is the first one. And in Fatiha, you have to read everything in, in, in Fatiha for it to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you do not read, recite Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, did you complete Surah Al Fatiha? No. Your prayer is what? Gone. So if you believe that Bismillahir Rahman Rahim is part of Surah Al Fatiha, so that means if you forgot it, that raka that you forgot to recite uh, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim is nullified. You have to pray one again and make sure you do so. But if you believe, like the majority, that Bismillahir Rahman Rahim is not part of Surah Al Fatiha, but it's just like any other Bismillahir Rahman Rahim in the Quran, that's why if you miss it, if you forgot it, you lost reward. But the prayer is. It's okay. Yeah. And the second one is much leaning to the people. Because I'm telling you, if you say that it is part, many, many, many people, their prayer is not going to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Actually, majority of the ummah. Yeah. Majority of the ummah. So that's the, the, the lesson we can learn from this uh, controversy among the scholars. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward your patience. So we will stop here, inshallah. Next. Uh, Class, we will continue from where we stop. Subhanak Allahum wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu Sorry, today we take long. Inshallah, next time we'll make it shorter. Easy. Question and answer. Any question? Question and answer. Inshallah.
Yes, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Sheikh, you said that if we were to take the opinion that uh, uh, Bismillah, but the Basmalah is not part of Fatiha, and then the majority of the people's prayers wouldn't be accepted, but doesn't Allah say in the Quran, Allah doesn't burden a soul beyond his capacity, so wouldn't they get the benefit of ignorance? Uh, no, the ignorance will not benefit them, but uh, the scholars who gave them the fatwa, they will be responsible. Those prayers will be accepted, but when you say uh, prayer is not accepted if someone did not recite surah uh, what do you call uh, bismillahir rahmanir rahim what what you are saying technically is anyone who did not recite bismillahir rahmanir rahim his prayer will not be accepted so then we have to apply another principle to save them from uh, missing and losing their own uh, prayers yeah, that's it but uh, uh, when when you say if i don't recite it uh, basically you are saying if i don't do it my prayer is is gone even if I, 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 I take my opinion from, uh, from another scholar. Yeah. But, uh, but alhamdulillah, in Islam, whatsoever you base it on opinion given to you by a scholar that you trust, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not hold you accountable of any mistake you make. Your deed will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as long as you're doing it right according to the sunnah, according to what you took from you. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive and accept it from you. The one who gave you the fatwa will be responsible. So it's up to him to base his own uh, reasoning on something which is concrete. Yeah. Allah Akbar. Sisters, any question? Yeah. Uh, Sheikh, you said that you have a little bit to each other. Okay. Make them one then. Uh, the first one, I want to, I want to expect that uh, we shouldn't be saying that I forget what I've memorized, but you should in fact say I was made to forget. Yeah. And, uh, the question, so okay, let me answer. Let me answer this. Okay, okay this 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 is true. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. But in uh, everything there is, there, I mean, there is a reason for that. This is not to say that I should be negligent after I memorize the Quran, and then when someone asks me why did you forget, I say no, I was caused to forget what I memorized. No, there are I mean ways to maintain what you have memorized. And uh, although you are making your effort to keep something, sometimes uh, you, you will forget something. The Prophet ﷺ was the best one in terms of reciting the Quran. He forgets sometimes. He prayed with the people and after the prayer he told them, uh, where is Ubayy? He said, ha another Rasulullah, I'm here. The Prophet ﷺ said, why didn't you remind me when I skip first so and so? And this is where we got that when the Imam, which is rejected also in some places, the Imam doesn't want anyone to correct him. Why, he, why is he making the mistake? Wallahu alam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa asked someone to correct him. And he blamed him. Why did you keep quiet? You, you, uh, you understand? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sometimes Allah SWT will take something. And sometimes Allah SWT will cause you to forget some, what, some of the things you memorize. You have to revise it and then you bring it back. This is one of the miracles and the ages of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is true the Prophet also said that don't say I forget. Say that uh, you should say Un see to uh to Kala What is the next question? Uh, is it sinful to uh, abandon one's memory to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There is hadith. Alhamdulillah the hadith is weak. <laughs> <laughs> Why else people they I mean we're in trouble because they said if you memorize Quran, any part of the Quran and you forget it, you will come uh, uh, back in the hereafter with leprosy with you. That's sign of good news or evil news. Evil news. But alhamdulillah, wherever you check the, the chain of narration of this hadith is weak. But the hadith is weak. Actually there is some there's another one more scary than than that. Leprosy is easier. But Alhamdulillah, that one also the scholars is, I mean, mentioned that it is based mainly on prayer, not the recitation. You remember in the hadith of the dream of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he saw the punishments of the grave. It's a very important hadith that I really recommend that you, you, you read it in Sahih Bukhari. It talks about the punishment in the grave. Uh, it will wake you up to remember what you are facing in the future. So in this hadith, the first person that the Prophet also mentioned, he said, I met a man lying down on the ground, and in front of him there is another person uh, holding a big, huge rock, bigger than the head of the one who is lying down. 
So what is the job of the one who is standing? The job is to take this big rock and crush the head of the one who is lying down. The, help, the head will be completely destroyed and the rock will jump to another place. And this person is going to go and take the rock. And you can see the head, there is no head, it's already gone. You can see the body is suffering. But the guy cannot do anything. The Prophet also asked him, he said, I never saw something like this, what is this? And the guy will go and take the rock and come back again and hit the head back again. So it's a very long hadith. In the end, Jibreel was the one who took the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Mikai to that journey. He told him the first person that you met is the one who is given Quran by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, but he neglected it. And he also he is not praying to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala constantly. That will be his punishment till the day of judgment. Imagine this is going to happen to someone. Continuously, after every second, this person is going to take and do this. And no death, no anything. You keep on suffering. Before the day of judgment, then you will receive the, the greater one. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So when I read this, I say, yes, although that hadith is not authentic, but a Muslim has to be careful because this is one of the greatest blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you after Islam. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, wallahi, memorizing the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it Ahlul Quran hum Ahlullahi wa khasatu. The closest people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the people who are memorizing his book. And still, you are not accepting the gift or you are not appreciating it by keeping what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. And what do you think? I mean, using your time, memorizing the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in the hereafter, you are not going to benefit from it. Because we are expecting you to receive the best from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So although that hadith is not authentic, but if you don't revise the Quran out of negligence, you have no reason. Many scholars mention that you will get sin from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you have excuse, for example, you are sick, or you are busy with something you couldn't have time to revise, which is, which is not possible to me, because when you memorize Quran, Whatever you're doing, a sister in the house can do everything. Revise the Quran. You don't need to open the Quran. No, you can watch the place, watch the kids and read your Quran. They will learn. So you can read Quran. And the brother also can recite Quran on the way. You're going to work, read Quran. Don't go the, to the masjid to motorbike or bicycle or, or car. Go walking. This is what the scholars used to do. Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, they said that he used to go to the masjid is too far alone. He will never let someone go with him. Why? Because he's revising his Quran on the way. One of the brothers I met, the senior brother in the Islamic University of Medina, he memorized the book of uh, Al-Fiyah and Al-Siyuti in Hadith, 1,000 lines of poetry on the way to pray. Every day he has a mount, only during the prayer time when he's going to the masjid will memorize. He was able to memorize the whole book is a time that we are wasting actually. I'm not saying don't go with anyone. No, go with someone who is like you who is going to do something also. But it's a very valuable time that you can revise your Quran. When in your car, revise your Quran. A brother used to visit a village and give them food. So some people asked him and told him, you're wasting your time. Why don't you make it, for example, monthly? Why do you need to go all the way to that place? He told them, no. I like to please those people and also at the same time also this is the time that I have to revise my Quran and look at how Allah SWT rewarded this person he had some problem with the car he stood at the side of the road he was fixing the, the car a speeding car came and get him one of the scholars who was mentioned in this he was an eyewitness he said I never saw something like this in my life a person who was completely destroyed bleeding but he said when we approached him, we found him reciting Quran as if there is nothing wrong with him. This is how he died. And you know what the Prophet Sallallahu said? The way you die, this is the way Allah Subhanahu is going to bring you back. So make the Quran, I mean, your routine. Imam Shatabi said, وَخَيْرُ جَلِيسٍ لَا يُمَلُّ حَدِيثُهُ وَتَرْدَادُهُ يَزْدَادُ فِيهِ تَجَمُّلًا The best thing that you will sit with, which you will never get bored of sitting with, is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the only book that the more you read it, the more interested, interested you find yourself in reading it more. 
Yeah, you read any book, after you finish, you don't like to come back to it again. If someone is reading it, you don't have interest in coming. But Quran, no. Every year we do the translation of the Quran, and every year you will find people, they are learning something new. Yeah. So this is the book of Allah SWT. So it is my personal <coughs> recommendation that you really, really free yourself to memorize Quran and try to keep it. Don't forget it because you will need it in the hereafter. Inshallah. May Allah SWT save all of us. Okay. Last question. Last question. Did you read that you died is the way that you will be bring back, right? So, yeah. what does it mean? Does it mean like, like if you die in, five, in tragedy, so does it mean... No, no, the, the, the situation you die. For example, you die, say, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Someone died, he was on top of his uh, animal, he fell down, and he stepped on him, he died during Hajj. Allah Akbar. The Prophet Allah said, don't put perfume on him. Don't cover his face. Because when you're making hajj, you don't cover the face, right, for the brother, right? So don't cover your face, and don't cover his face, and don't put perfume on him because he is going to be resurrected in the hereafter, mulabbiya. He will come back to Allah SWT saying, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik, Allah Akbar. You die saying, la ilaha illallah, you will come back to Allah SWT saying, la ilaha illallah. There, is this, there was a sister who died making sujood. That the child, the son tried to when she was about to die, he tried to make her straight. She said, leave me alone. And she passed away. And they tried to make her straight. They couldn't. They asked one of the scholars. He, he told them that this is the way Allah SWT is going to bring her back. The way they die, this is the way Allah SWT will bring them back. So she will come back to Allah SWT and it's also sujood. Likewise, when someone died watching bad movies, he will come back to Allah SWT and that Allah will start. Someone died drinking wine, he will come back to Allah SWT drinking wine. Someone died doing anything evil, he will come back to Allah. That, the worst thing I, 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 I heard from one of the scholars a long time ago, a brother was waiting for a sister to go to a country, I will not mention the name of the country, to do evil things. One of those bad places. She did not come. He was very angry, very angry, very angry. All of the rest of the friends, they got there girls, Allah understand. Except him. He did not know that, that this is mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was very upset, very angry. After a few minutes before the flight um, takes off, he saw her coming from far away. Look at the happiness. He bowed down, prostrating. Wallahi the Sheikh said, they took him from that place to the graveyard. I always, when I read this, I just look at myself, imagine, how can you explain it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You are going to come back in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a prostitute woman in front of you making sujood to her. No explanation. Because in the hereafter, you are coming back reading Quran. You are coming back saying la ilaha illallah because of the tragedy. <coughs> that exists on that day, you still have the fear that something else will happen. Nuh والسلام, was in the state of fear. Adam was in the state of fear. All of those prophets, they were in the state of fear. And then someone is going to come back to Allah's water in this nature. And then he still have hope. So that's why the scholars mentioned that the problem is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, you insist in your committing sin and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The issue is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiving, accepting your repentance. No. Issue that you have to be very careful with is you committing sin after repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take your soul at that moment because you don't know when death is going to come to you. So that's it, uh, sister. In any situation you die, this is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring you back. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take our life, our life when we are in a state of righteousness. Shaykh, one last question, please. Okay. Uh, you said choose a scholar who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? Just, like, can you just give like a couple how? of statements how you would Yeah, I know he's going to put me into this trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are, there are some people, honestly speaking, when, uh, I mean, although we have very little knowledge, but we can, uh, I, I mean, per, uh, perceive from, uh, I mean, uh, insight from our heart that this one knows what exactly he's doing. And that's one. And also, uh, you can see the way he stick with the sunnah of the Prophet he does not compromise. Uh, 
this is one of the I mean hints I can I can give you the way someone is sticking with the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi especially the simple ones that people are neglecting. Yeah, is, some scholars are very strict in in this, uh, following the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam step by step, and whenever they don't know something, they will tell you we don't know. Yeah, so these are the things because uh, Sheikh Muhammad, you don't know what is in the heart. Yeah, but uh, the the heart is having Iman which is translated by the limbs, the part of the body. So someone prays on time, someone, I mean, he shows that he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we give him that. And you will find, I'm telling you, if someone is lying or showing off, I'm telling you, your heart will, is, will reject. But if someone is truly fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find yourself accepting him automatically, without even knowing why. As the nature, so this is the nature of the heart. Actually, it goes towards someone who is fearing Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So before Sheikh Masri kill us, we make a stop here. So may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reward all of you. And may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala increase your knowledge. And may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala increase your sincerity and your patience. In the holy that called Qadir Ali. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shalallahu ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi. Hoping to see you in the next class, inshallah.